be around. Okay. Hello once again. Thank you all for coming to our round table about history of masculinity. Thank you all for coming in such a great number on this such a hot day. Uh, Today we have, uh, I have a great honor to welcome on behalf of the uh, team of the um, Europe and Serbia uh, cultural transfer from 19th to 21st century team project to Professor Wolfgang Schmale, our, um, uh, the author of the book of History of Masculinity in Europe. And today we, are, we, we will be talking about a little bit about, about this book and about his research. Let me just few, say a few, 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 few words about history of masculinity, of masculinity studies. The critical studies of men and masculinities uh, is a relatively new academic field that was grown rapidly over the last two decades. The field, which initially fed from sociology, psychology, anthropology, and history, considers masculinity as a historical, cultural, and social construct and aims to provide insi insight into the sources and uh, manifestations of mas masculine power and domination, explore how masculinity identities are constructed and performed, and elucidate the, different, the differences and similarities between men and as individuals or as a group around the issues of sex, sexuality, identity, culture, and other persistent social issues with a wide range of academic fields. The last two decades have been uh, uh, characterized by an uh, increased empirical diversity and development of the new theoretical perspective spread into a variety of social sciences and humanities disciplines. A growing number of masculinity scholars have uh, integrated theoretical insights from the third way of feminism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, queer and sexuality studies, as well as intersections of gender, class, ethnicity, race, disability, and age. The field, which was, was predominantly uh, developed in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, has also spread to all parts of the world, exploring regional, national, and local masculinities. And here again, we are witnessing um, uh, transfer of knowledge, cultural transfer about my, of masculinity studies. And uh, uh, today we're going to uh, talk about the first book about masculinity, history of masculinity in Europe, as Professor Smale um, stressed it in, in the introduction of, of his book. Uh, let me tell you just a few words about our um, uh, speakers today. Uh, professor Wolfgang Schmale was a, pluf, pr a full professor of modern and contemporary history at the University of Vienna. He is a member of Academia Europea, the uh, European Academy of Science and Arts, Arts, the Academy Committee of the House of European History in Brussels, as well as various other uh, scientific associations. He has ex uh, extensively published on a cultural transfer in modern and contemporary history, and four of uh, Professor Sersmale's books have been translated into Serbian, uh, thanks to a publishing house uh, Clio. We here have a copies of the history of mas masculinity, but uh, uh, among the history of masculinity is a history of uh, what will the EU uh, be, history and the future, uh, societal orientation, history of the Enlightenment in the global New Age, and uh, history of Europe. That was the first book that was published in in Serbian in 2003. Uh, uh, second of our panelist today is Professor, professor Marina Simic. She is a full professor uh, of the cultural uh, theory and cultural studies at the Faculty of Political Sciences at the University of Be Belgrade. She uh, graduated from the U University of Belgrade, obtaining her BA in Ethnology and Anthropology and in, uh, the uh, second BA in Serbian and Comparative Literature uh, with Serbian language. And she received her MA and PhD in Social Anthropology from the University of Manchester. She ha uh, has been awarded several scholarships and awards, including a Radcliffe Brown Award of, by Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. Professor Simic writes on anthropological aspects of post-socialist transformation in Europe and various aspects of cultural and ant anthropological theory. Her her book, Cosmopolitan Longing, Ethnography of Serbian Post-Socialism, Cosmopolitska uh, Cezhnya, Ethnografia Srpskog Post-Socialisma, has been awarded by Ethnographic Institute of Serbian Academy of Science and Arts. And her, uh, her last book, uh, Ontological Turn, Introduction in the Cultural Theory of, of Alterity, 
ontološki obrat, uvod kulturno teoriju alteriteta deals with the most recent debates in anthropology and cultural studies about alterative perspectivism, multi-trans, multi- Naturalism, Knowledge and Truth. She is also a poet and libretto writer. And last of our um, panelists today is Professor Slobodan Marković. He is full professor of political, uh, politic and cultural anthropology and politic, political history uh, of the Southeastern Europe at the Faculty of Political Sciences in Belgrade and at the Institute of European Studies. His books, uh, edited volumes and studies deal with the British-Balkan relations and cultural transfer Europe-Serbia. He has also published work on Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis anthropology and, uh, and takes an interest in the history of European pessimism. He has been a head of the Center of British Studies since the uh, inception in 2017 and research associate at LSE at London School of Economics since 2012 and uh, LSE IDEA since 2019. Since 2020, he has served as the head of the project Cultural Transfer Europe-Serbia from the 19th to 21st century. In 2023, he was um, a fellow at the Institute of Humanity, Sci uh, Humanity Science in Vienna. He is a member of Academia Europea as well. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, uh, to, 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 to ask Professor Schmale to address to us, to, 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 to talk about a little bit about his uh, research from 2000, I think 2003, it was first published, this book, but okay, it was a longer time ago, but nevertheless, interesting nowadays. Here you are, thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for the introduction and welcome to all of you. And thank you, Slobodan and Marina for the initiative and being willing to comment on an old book. <laughs> I started working uh, on this history of masculinity in Europe in the modern era in the late 1990s. There, and this time there was much uh, discussion about the changing roles of men in society. And it was obvious that the principle of equality between men and women which most all, all legal systems in Europe provided for, had been little realized in practice. Other diverse sexual orientations beyond homosexuality and heterosexuality were hardly discussed at this time. In general, the social relationship between the sexes was still characterized by the persistence of hegemonic masculinity, which Raven Colnandel had deconstructed in his influential book, Masculinities, in 1995. Students at the universities were where I worked at that time. So this was the Technical University in Braunschweig in Germany, the University of Munich, uh, then later the University of Graz, and uh, since 1999 the University of Vienna, where I started to write the book. The students were very interested in gender studies, and in particular in men's studies. For many students and academics, engaging with the topics of gender and men's studies meant more than just studying and researching. It was part of their self-positioning, or to find out their own identity. Researching men, not in the sense of the great men who make history, but in a different way, was part of a social emancipation from the hegemonic masculinity that still prevailed. Hegemonic masculinity as a social concept has its roots in Europe in the 18th century. Its social implementation took more than 100 years and was very advanced in the age of imperialism. I have given this historical process a lot of space in the book, but I embed this era, as to say, era of hegemonic masculinity in a before and an after. In practice, Masculinity has by no means always been hegemonic. There were alternatives. 
I considered it important and still do so to demonstrate that masculinity historically always appears in the plural as masculinities and that these were very diverse. The essentialism that underlies hegemonic masculinity must be historicized. It is by no means a consistent historical phenomenon. And the book therefore followed the principles of deconstructing and decentering. In the meantime, European societies are once again allowing more diversity, even if this is sometimes met with fierce resistance and there are setbacks, at least exactly in 2024. I place the last chapter of the book, which deals with the present, and present means in the book around 2000, in the perspective of polymorphous identities. This was a concept much debated at uh, this time. There was certainly an element of optimism in that, because if you consider everything that has become known about sexual abuse today, in 2024, Doubts can arise as to whether gender equality, gender justice, and non-discrimination have taken the place of hegemonic masculinity. The term toxic masculinity, which has long been commonplace today, was hardly used, if at all, in the years when I started to work on the book. So 20, 25 years ago, toxic masculinity was not a term in the public debate, and even in uh, scientific research, it was not used so far, I can see. It is therefore debate, debatable whether hegemonic masculinity was followed by toxic masculinity and not polymorphous masculinity. So if I had to write a new last chapter of the book, I think there would be a revision of my more or less optimistic view 25 years ago. So far as an introduction and a self-positioning in the history since uh, the publication of the original edition of the history of masculinities. Yo, that's for the moment. Just uh, one remark, uh, due to the fact that it's very hot and that everyone uses air conditions in our building, we can have uh, short uh, cuts of uh, electricity supply at certain moments, which will, however, not last more than 10 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds. This is for the people who follow us, because this uh, whole event is also transmitted via Zoom. So for those following us about, uh, through Zoom, do not worry if you have, uh, uh, if this happens, and this is going to happen most likely, just register again and continue to watch us through Zoom. Thank you. Sorry for this uh, necessary explanation. Um, thank you very much <clears throat> for inviting me uh, to comment on, on, on this book. I um, greatly enjoyed reading it. And uh, I also uh, prepared a short uh, presentation with some um, illustrations that may kind of help us a bit uh, to follow uh, what I prepared to say, although I don't really like PowerPoint presentation, but it may be useful sometimes. Um, so, um, uh, um, as I already uh, uh, said, uh, uh, this uh, uh, book is very enjoyable to read, so I invite you to read it. And it's not only a good academic text with broad historical scope, but it's also entertaining. And it, it can almost be read as a piece of literature, and I think that's something we should all strive to. So I really admire that greatly.
Um, um, uh, Professor Schmaler analyzes also art and diaries, presenting us with vivid images of masculinity in different periods in modern European history. And I particularly like graphic representation of masculinity that uh, uh, um, appear in these uh, books, which are not dull, sterile diagrams that we uh, are used to, but very dynamic representations of the dominant ideas of the period. And um, they uh, actually invite us to think in a more kind of, um, uh, in a not straightforward way, just to kind of um, go through them uh, and to see where they can lead us and they lead us in multiple directions. So Professor Schmaler shows how ideas of masculinity uh, change over time and not, and that's me as an anthropologist by training, find very important, not in a linear succession of ideas that lead from the wrong towards the right ones that we know today due to the development of science, but rather through their slow and partial transformations that produce various novel forms. So Professor Schmale covers the emergence of various concepts that were important to European concepts of man. Some that are be expected to be important, such as, um, sorry? Uh, yes. Ah, OK. You just uh, say, next slide, next slide. Ah, okay. slide. Um, so uh, uh, in the books, uh, various concepts are um, covered, and some are expected to be important for concepts of masculinity, such as body, sexual dimorphism, and conceptions, conception, and some that are less accepted to be so, expected to be so, such as consumption, honor, and friendship. And it is impossible to deal with all these um, concepts here in the short talk. And I decided to focus to those I personally find most inspiring uh, um, at the moment, which is body, sexual dimorphism and conception, as they seem to me fundamental for identifying who is a man and uh, who is not. So I will start uh, with body. Establishing what constitutes a male body is of course of crucial importance for creating the idea of masculinity. And what a male body is, is far from the obvious. Renaissance idea of masculinity were based on one sex model. That does not reject ex the existence of different sexes, and I'm quoting Schmale here, but take male body as the basic form, form of both sexes. And as Professor Schmale explains, and I'm quoting him, anatomists and learned men, men of course, failed to establish important anatomical differences between male and female bodies although they performed autopsy on both female and male corpses. And for some authors that Schmaler refers to, um, such as Lacan, uh, that is a consequence of ideology, while for Foucault, that is a result of specific discursive practices that produce both sex and sexuality. These practices must be understood in the specific historical context in which they occur. And that is precisely what Schmaler does. One sex model, that dominate in 16th century Europe was not directing, directed against the notion of different social sexes, but explain sex organs predominantly as the variation of one kind. Thus, vagina is not the opposite of penis, as Freud taught us, but an interior penis, the uterus as cotrum, ovaries are testicles, and so on and so forth. And as Schmal explains, and quoting him, in 16th century masculinity, and femininity are not only con con conditionally constituted according to their bodies that supposes to be different, but they actually come from one model that then produce them and separate them, separate them into two. The model of sexual dimorphism that we are the most familiar with, which understood male, understands male and female sexes as opposite, emerges in the period of enlightenment. Two sex models should be then ascribed to the 18th century when biological and sociological sex became equated. While differences between male and female bodies started to be seen as essential and identified with different social roles. In other words, different sexes signaled different sociality, something that we will come to call gender. 
in 16th century, we still do not talk about sex, sex identity. The very idea of identity is something that will emerge in 20th century. We don't have it before that. But, and I'm quoting the, the Schmaler again, but man as a general model of masculinity will become and remain universal model of humanity. Sorry, I missed this. So this is kind of how the, the, the concept of body uh, which of course is crucial to how we understand both men and women were uh, uh, conceptualized, uh, came, to, uh, uh, came to force in the 16th century and in the 18th, 19th century uh, became what we uh, uh, know uh, uh, as a split between sex and gender. That's something which emerged actually much later in the 19th century. In the 20th century it became uh, theoretically conceptualized. And the, the next thing I want to talk about is the idea of conception which is, of course, very important and closely related to the idea of body. In the early modern era, Galen's theory of two seeds, or two semen, which came from the second century, was further developed in order to understand the conception as the mixture between two seeds. Still, man's seed is one that possesses formative strength, as Schmaler calls it. Obviously, in patrilinear cognitic kinship, such as modern European one, the effort had to be made in finding an explanation why children sometimes also look like their mothers. Because if they, I will explain that later, just to say that cognitive kinship is a mode of descent calculating from an ancestor countering to any combination of male and female links. And obviously in patrilinear societies, then the male link is dominate, dominated one. And this theory um, of two seeds, although Clearly, patrilinear helped to explain this problem because man's seed was the formative seed, not the, the female one. And in, on the other hand, in matrilinear societies, like those, for example, described by Malinovsky in Melanesia in the 20s, formative strength comes from the mother, while the father secures food for the fetus in the form of sperm, and that is why children look like their mothers. So there are kind of two uh, different ideas of uh, how basically um, uh, uh, human beings are come to being. So in patrilinear societies, formative seed is coming from the man. In matrilinear societies, formative seed is coming from the mother, although in Milanese it's not formative seed, it's something else, but the, the, that's the principle. So European ideas of procreation based on the strength of male seed is the basis of male reproductive and creative strength, and this is important, are, I will say, brilliantly explained um, by Schmal analysis of artworks of the period. And that's what I'm kind of going to use here as an um, illustration. Um, this is the uh, uh, painting by um, El Greco, uh, a painting in the early 17th century between 1610 and 1614, that depicts um, a Greek myth based on uh, Virgil's Enid. Um, Lacon is the priest of Troy, who recognized that that's the picture of him and his son. Um, he recognized uh, that the monumental wooden horse that will um, uh, uh, bring Troy to the end was a Greek deception, a trick rather than a gift. And he threw his spear at it and begged the Trojans not to pull the horse into the city. Athens, who was in favor of the Greeks, punished his action by sending two serpents to kill the priest and his two sons. The Trojans misread the cause of Lacan's death, throw the horse into the city, and the Greek soldiers hide them inside it and push the Trojans and lay the ways to Troy. That's the myth. We know it. And this is the picture of it. And what we see um, in this uh, 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 painting are the three um, male uh, figures uh, placed in different positions that represent uh, life phases, as Schmaler uh, uh, explains. The only figure that is frontally facing a viewer and whose genitalia are visible is a boy, because he's yet to become a man. This way of presentation is possibly only possible only because boys of that age still do not have shape-giving semen, and is thus more similar to women than to men. Male semen was understood as a bearer of the idea of man, and this is important. That ignited its very origin, and it's pun intended. Uh, for example, Dutch mathematicians and physics, Nicholas Hoster and Antonio Phillips van Leeuwenhoek, used primitive microscopes developed at the time to discover sperm cells that were understood as vessels for small men who are accepted ovum and grown there. In other words, 
at the beginning of the 18th century, it was concluded um, that both women and men participate in the conceptions, but the men are those who give life. And this idea um, will change in the 19th century when Karl Ernest Lambert, Prussian Estonian embryologist, who further advanced microscope, understood ovum as an egg, a nutritious element that feeds the fetus. And this is consistent with Christian and both Muslim tradition, and of course, European folk theory of procreation, that basically understand it as a planting the seed into the field. So all of was initially understood as a kind of nurturing, nurturing materials. Like in matrilinear society, semen is uh, um, uh, nurturing the fetus. In patrilinear, the, the ovum is just a kind of uh, uh, source of food for, 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 for fetus. Um, so, and of course, this is the idea that we have in our own language. We say that to make a child. So we say for men that they We have it in our own language. So um, these theories of um, procreation imply more than relationship between sexes, but includes ideas of creation in broader sense, and that's what I find particularly important. Theory of monogenesis from one seed and monotheism are part of the same worldview. In big monotheistic religions that we know today, God is a creator who created the world himself without the help from a partner. In polytheistic religion of the Middle East, for example, there are God and the goddess in the creation. The difference between monotheism and polytheism is not only quantitative, but qualitative, and it spreads to all spheres of life, including science. Thus, and this is for the discipline that I'm coming from, monotheistic and male origin of human species was in the center of anthropological debates about monogenesis and polygenesis on human species in the 19th century. So this kind of, if the human species is one species, one species then it must come from one origin. If it has multiple origins, then it's not one space. And that's the same logic that we have in this idea of, of procreation and uh, um, conception. Um, again, <clears throat> um, we see uh, the, 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 the kernel of this idea in the 16th uh, uh, um, century. And I'm going again uh, uh, back to Schmale's uh, wonderful analysis of uh, various art sources and uh, uh, autobiographies. And um, he analyzes biography of Benvenuto Cellini, who is 16th century Italian goldsmith, sculptor, author, uh, um, and so on. And uh, uh, Schmale writes that uh, um, when he, he talks about his own birth, uh, um, Cellini says um, uh, um, that uh, uh, the very proof of his uh, um, uh, birth is, uh, um, um, what's the word, um, uh, confirms uh, uh, God's grace because um, God, uh, the Father is mediator of God's voice and God speaks to the Father, I'm quoting Schmale. The very birth of Cellini is the proof of it and the Father named the boy Benvenuto welcome by God's grace. Male beings come from God, God, the sense, body of the family, fortune and the stars, in combination with unavoidable life stages that we saw previously, um, actually forms nature of um, individually defined uh, uh, masculinity. And um, conception, um, as well as, as a fatherhood, um, as we see here, um, is a concept is not a, a categorical entity uh, whose presence or absence can be simply determined. Um, the way it is understood can only be apprehended if we understand it through the relationship between various concepts and ideas from the seemingly various domains. And that is exactly what uh, Professor Schmaler does uh, in these books and in a much uh, more interesting and playful way than I um, did it here. Um, so procreation, for example, includes other categories, uh, of course, some that are expected to like sex and kinship, but some other as well, like authority, honor, friendship, and so on. And for my the last uh, a bit of this talk, I will stop at this uh, um, last one, the idea of friendship, because um, uh, it's uh, uh, maybe unexpected, but particularly important for uh, understanding of public space and everything that is informed, in part of, performed in public space, including science. 
the friend, the very concept of a friend is developed through male to male friendship that does not correspond to the certain anthropology of a time, if you're talking about a 17th century, uh, and then I'm using the word uh, uh, anthropology here, Schmale as well uses it as a general understanding of what humanity is, but also anthropology as an academic discipline of today that use it in a very similar way, in which it is separable from a certain relationship to truth, which is developed in Greek, um, in Greek philosophy, and uh, molded in early modern Europe. Very philia, um, like um, in philosophy and other words that we have philia in it, in friendship as well, philia is embodied in the friend rival of Greek philosophy, and it's constitutive to Occidental knowledge. And I'm uh, quoting here one Brazilian anthropologist called Vieros de Castro. Um, the friend is what uh, Deleuze and Gattari uh, call intrinsic to thought, and then quoting them, a condition of possibility of thought itself, a living cat category, a transcendental lived reality. And it is also ultimate other of Occidental thought, based on the mirror image of the male self. So this very concept of friendship um, that emerged, that was um, that we have all, uh, in, in ancient Greek and in various ways was um, adapted through European history, was also important to uh, establish all practices, or some practices, I wouldn't say maybe all, that we perform in the public space, and science is one of them. And these uh, uh, concepts, and there are many others uh, that Professor Schmale uh, uh, describes, um, show uh, complex ways in which uh, uh, they are spread and transformed, and they really, um, inspire me thinking about various other uh, things, including this idea of um, uh, science and uh, 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 truth. And I um, highly recommend it. Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, what uh, uh, I find it particularly valuable is that it opens um, um, various avenues for uh, exploration uh, um, that can be uh, um, uh, put uh, in, I don't know how was put it, in various courses. Thank you, Marina, very much. Slobodan? Yes, you're yeah. waiting for the for presentation. You need... Okay, thank you. I'm very glad that we are here today at the Institute for European Studies, which is uh, one of actually the major um, uh, organization within Cultural Transfer Europe Serbia project because the most of researchers for the project come from this institute, although technically just because I am employed at the Faculty of Political Science with bigger percentage than here, it is considered to be, the Faculty of Political Science is considered to be the lead institution within the project. Um, and uh, Professor Schmala has already, uh, was already uh, here. He was speaking about uh, the European Union several years ago and also participated in some of our other projects, including uh, History of Free Masonry in Southeast Europe and including um, uh, the original conference, uh, which he was present through Zoom, uh, which gave us uh, in a way, analytical framework for, for the whole project on what cultural transfer is and why it is so important. At the very uh, beginning, allow me to say that uh, this history of masculinity in Europe is a multidisciplinary book. And uh, uh, when historians read, uh, uh, intellectual historians read works by uh, uh, social scientists, they are very often surprised with the lack of sources that they used, but in spite of that, they made very huge generalizations. On the other hand, uh, social scientists are surprised when they read historiography, uh, works of historiography that historians often do not use any theoretical concepts. So this is not, uh, this is the book that he has been able to bridge both types of concerns 
it is based on primary sources, but it uses analytical uh, categories provided by social sciences, without which most of these things couldn't even be discussed, because if you don't have analytical categories, you cannot even analyze them. You cannot analyze hegemonic masculinity un unless it's defined. You cannot, as Professor Schmeile already mentioned, analyze toxic masculinity until it becomes analytical category. Um, so, uh, what is really good here is that it's based on primary sources on uh, autobiographies, diaries, letters, and Marina, uh, as someone who deals very much with arts, uh, presented to you also very rich art material that uh, Professor Schmale has used. I will go chronologically to explain uh, what are the results of this book, and at the end, I will try to say how we could potentially implement some of these findings to the history of sexuality in the Balkans and in Serbia. Uh, so, uh, the book starts with 1450, so essentially it starts with the concept of New Adam, and this New Adam has certain features, uh, which are even today associated with masculinity. So, this new man uh, enjoys certain virtues such as temperance, righteousness, wisdom, courage. And, um, and then uh, Renaissance uh, gives uh, new overtones. Uh, masculinity means honor, but honor differs by state. It depends uh, what is your social position? Social lives and social spaces of men and women are mostly separated. Marriage is the fundament of the social order, but in the 16th century, male sexuality is not limited to marriage. And so this is not only the book about masculinities, this is the book on different understanding of how sexuality uh, can be expressed. And we are still under the influence, perhaps even more in this region than in some other regions of Europe. Uh, we still uh, are under impression of patriarchal uh, ways of understanding sexuality. But I will argue at the end that we are wrong even about patriarchal expressions of sexuality. Uh, because actually there are masculinities and there are sexualities. And I will say that at the end. The social place of men is in, restaurant as we would call it today, and uh, their ritual is to have drinks. Friendship is possible only with male individuals. It may be homoerotic and homosexual. It has, may have homosexual components. Persecution of sodomites, as homosexuals are called, was sporadic and was often not implemented. But there were also original patterns about that. Of course, it's not only that it wasn't implemented, it was almost normative at certain policies. So in those cases, it couldn't be uh, prosecuted for the very fact because it would mean attack to the social order of those policies. There is no sex or gender identity. I use gender in the previous sense. English language is not clear. Gender means sex since 1980, and since 1980 means what it means in in gender studies. But, okay, to be more precise, there is no sex identity. The art of Renaissance uses androgynous models, but it would be too bold to call the whole era androgynous. Boys are seen, as Marina noticed, as similar in nature and appearance to women. So, relations between some of the protagonists of the book with boys were not considered as homosexual because boys had no sex. Trousers become a constituent part of masculinity. Masculinity and femininity emerged in modern period, but they are not sex identities. Androgynous elements are still very strong. And of course, for every epoch, Professor Schmale took one typical autobiography as a kind of illustration. So for the first one, it's Benvenuto Cellini who presents himself in an ambisexual way, with an emphasis on heterosexuality, but doesn't hide his homoerotic and homosexual relations. 
He also depicts ambisexual background. There are two types of sexuality, satisfaction through carnal lust, and he doesn't hide that uh, there is this type of sexuality, which has nothing to do with procreation. So let's say satisfaction-focused sexuality, and there is procreation-focused sexuality. So there are two types, both are there in his biography, autobiography. He doesn't really hide it. He was accused and sentenced on multiple occasions for sodomy. He doesn't hide that. Life of man is predestined by God and the universe, and sexuality is fluid. So that's one type of sexuality. And then comes uh, one of the problems of uh, when social scientists deal with uh, sexuality. They quote one source from 1600 and then another from 1800, but something happened in the meantime. <laughs> and was very different. So, in this book, you have this succession of what was happening mainly in Western Europe. For what was happening in the Balkans, the things are very complicated, even more so in Serbian case than in other cases, because since about 1700, we have the culture of Habsburg Serbs and the culture of Serbs in Ottoman Empire, which differ very much. And uh, then we would have to follow both tracks and then to see how they get united at some point in the late 19th century. So another uh, in this succession, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, period that Samuel Pepys, the man who was the president of the Royal Historical Society, the same society of which Christopher Wren was the president and uh, later Isaac Newton, so the nature of man in his uh, diaries is in his impulse that need to be restrained. And what is new, Pips is very much closer to our own world of 2024 than Cellini, or, or at least to mainstream world. Cellini may be closer to some subcultures. Uh, he consults with doctors, for instance, about his health. He undergoes operations. He uses medical tools. Uh, he even uh, is a part of consumerism. So all, all very new features, all features that are, um, that are typical of our age. But unlike the 19th century, he has numerous sexual excursions with maids and the wives of uh, persons who are in clientelist relations to him. Uh, occasionally, he mentions erections and ejaculations in his diary. He reads scientific treatises, also something new, 17th century. And um, he mentions, though, unlike Cellini, sexuality only in hetero context. And uh, the issue of righteousness is not the central one for, for him. So there are some new features in um, understanding of male sex sexuality. So what Marina already mentioned, we come towards sex as identity in the 17th and the 18th century. Since she already explained it, I will not go too much into details. I will just mention that the Enlightenment with its categorization uh, and this is nothing new to say, uh, it had uh, an ambition to categorize all the knowledge. And of course, Enlightenment thinkers believed that in that way, they would liberate humanity from medieval misconceptions and religious uh, uh, constraints. Uh, but also they captured us into certain categories, such as categories of race, and also sexual categories. And famously or infamously, uh, Linnaeus has uh, uh, in a way captured us into four races, six actually he mentions, but two hominis fairy and hominis monstrosi cannot be used anymore because we know they don't exist. He still believed they existed, the wild man and monstrous man. Uh, but, and then, uh, 
this new knowledge was understood as a new type of truth. So it was a kind of secular religion that replaced classical religion. And this also had effects on sexuality. And in the late 17th and 18th century, an ideal type of man was constructed and was personified in French King Louis XIV, who was occasionally depicted as Hercules. There is nothing actually similar between Hercules and Louis XIV, but that shows you that you can construct. In, in making constructions, you can easily uh, turn uh, something that visibly does not match the ideal, uh, but in ideal construction, you can actually easily do it. Uh, and this hero, constructed in this age, prepares, it's a preparation, it's not really present at the French uh, court of Bourbons. French court of Bourbons are full of uh, both heterosexual and homosexual, and exclusively homosexual circles. But, nonetheless, the hero prepares an exclusive heterosexual normativity of masculinity, and the studies of anatomy only reinforce the model. And uh, something that existed there and something that still exists today and something that the far right insists on is that uh, the age of the enlightenment it's very strange but actually the far right agrees with the age of the enlightenment in that sense that they are enlightenment thinkers in that sense and it is that uh, biological categorizations express essential issues um, and uh, now we come to, to, to the beginnings of the hegemonic masculinity, and there is one uh, very interesting uh, person, I didn't know about him before I read the book, and it's uh, a Swiss person, Ulrich Becker, and um, uh, his uh, case describes this transition to the hegemonic masculinity, when he was four, his father dressed him uh, to trousers, and that became external sign that he became a man. At his home, there was a daily fight about doing different activities and who would be the boss in the household. And another underlying element from Renaissance up to now is that masculinity feels internally threatened more and more and more and more. So hegemonic masculinity can also be seen as a reaction to it. Uh, so at his home, uh, there was a daily fight about doing different activities. Education was upbringing through pressure. This brings us to Freud. A reason and cultivation, they both belong to human nature, emotion, uh, to nature, human nature of males, and emotions belong to, to the human nature of females. I'm using a little bit of new terminology, a little bit of old. So there is feminine masculine division in that sense. When his father was impoverished, he moves to a different house in which a beggar tried to have sex with him and he saved himself from the monster. And this is very important at the age of 20, he had the first experience of being in love, but there was no one he could ask for a counsel. Uh, he had to find himself what he was supposed to do. And another thing that is uh, important, uh, it is that uh, at this stage, men start to be engaged in mercenary armies and other armies. And in, in his case, we vividly see how much men are afraid of actually losing their lives when they are in the army, something that during hegemonic masculinity at certain period, the man would be prohibited to discuss. Because it goes without saying, you should die for your fatherland, then you should be actually even proud of, for doing that. Although it's not clear how. And one of the most remarkable uh, elements of this new hegemonic uh, masculinity we find in the book by Johann Christoph Friedrich Gutzmutz, 
uh, and uh, he's the author of uh, Gymnastik für die Jugend, which was immediately translated as British and American. Uh, uh, here you see, I think, uh, American translation in 1800 and 1802. And he noticed, and here we come to our own problems of today, it is nice when boys and adolescents fly away at command and everyone takes his position. When they stand in a row to which each of them belongs, when they take good posture and well-mannered as one body, march away wherever they are ordered. So through gymnastics, you will learn how to be disciplined. You will know exactly your place where you should stop. And that's it. And of course, very soon afterwards, it wasn't pr probably a good smooth idea, but we shouldn't, uh, you know, accuse Hegel of what happened 150 or Plato or whatever. So I'm not accusing good smooths, I'm just saying what followed from this. What followed from this in the next episode was now the nation state will tell you where that position will be and it will allocate you not very differently from what George Orwell described uh, in his dystopia a little bit later. And here we come to the hegemonic masculinity of the French Revolution, uh, a regenerated state through regenerated masculinity. And as uh, Professor Schmale correctly points out, the rights of man are not the rights of humans, they are the rights of males, so we must reread all those texts again in new context. They have nothing to do with humans. They do with one half of humanity. They are the rights of males. Essentially, the events and documents of the French Revolution reveal a new construction of the man in the anthropology of the Enlightenment and Revolution. The new man is the new male and he needs the apparatus of power with the aim to impose social discipline and to secure hegemony for the model. The new male becomes the exemplary model during the terror. So the terror, in a way, fully shapes new masculinity, the period of the terror, the last phase of the revolution. He is exclusively heterosexual, Moreover, the enemies of the fatherland and the revolution are sodomites. However, homosexuality was never outlawed in France since the age of the revolution, except in Vichy's France. So that's one single exception in Europe where uh, there was a much bigger tolerance than anywhere else. Uh, in this uh, wave, political space through this wave, political space becomes male and family-related space becomes female, something that is typical of patrilinear societies, patrifocal societies, even better, to be even more exact, in traditional societies. And now we come to the climax of the hegemonic masculinity, uh, when sport becomes a bridge between militarism and masculinity, and Good Smoots writes another popular book, Textbooks of Gymnastics for the Sons of the Fatherland, in 1817. That is now something that, when we come to nation-state. And as Professor Schmale correctly and uh, very brilliantly encapsulates in one single sentence, everything, everything indeed, ideational, material, body-related, moral and habitual, is expressed through sexual dichotomy and is asymmetrically marked with the superior masculinity. So this hegemonic masculinity goes hand in hand with modern police that organizes surveillance of alternative sexuality to delineate discursive frontiers. And, you know, back in 1900, no one could have imagined that uh, anything but heterosexuality would be allowed in Britain. Actually, if you were British and had any kind of alternative sexuality, you, you would be most likely to become an emigrant if you had money. You wouldn't even continue to live there. If you continue to live there, you risked 
actually spending some time in jail. The army becomes the key place of mail gathering. And this is new, this is very secular. Neither church nor professional orientation may be compared with army's influence in this field. Obligatory military service is the so of the so-called national armies becomes the basis for the development of the hegemonic masculinity. A clean and tidy uniform becomes the symbol of masculinity in generations of men. The militarization of masculinity reaches the civil sphere and the press, of course, plays its role. And I will add something that is not in the book, that is more something that, but although <laughs> Marina touched it, it is what Freud added to all of this. So, what Freud insisted on, he of course observed hegemonic masculinity. He wrongly believed that hegemonic masculinity was the natural state of, uh, of uh, humankind. And of course, he identified those traditional societies that were patrifocal, in which the position of women was even worse than in, in his own Vienna. So mechanisms of uh, culture were mechanisms of sexual repression. Uh, neurosis was the result of this cult of this repression, or as Stefan Zweig put it, describing the situation before World War I. But this fear of everything corporal and natural indeed penetrated up to the highest strata and deeply into all people with the ferocity of a real neurosis. And what Stefan Zweig described to us, something that we usually forget, is the first sexual revolution that happened in the interwar period, or we could call it maybe not sexual revolution, but first great sexual change. Uh, and it included undressing, for instance. Before that, bodies were covered in, in European context, in the way almost they are covered now in some societies that are considered not to be very uh, up, uh, very in line with modernity, but actually in, in this type of modernity, uh, they, they were very much dressed. And Viennese reaction to this type of repressed sexuality was Richard von Kraft Ebing, who made the first uh, catalogue of uh, perversions, as they were called now, or as we would call them now today, officially as paraphilia then Sigmund Freud, Arthur Schnitzler, and Stefan Zweig. An American reaction to that was in anthropology. That was Margaret Mead and later Alfred Kinsey. And they jointly deconstructed it. Later, Norbert Elias, a little bit later, actually demonstrated that Freud was correct, but was historical. Everything he described was indeed like that, but it was the result of the process of civilization and basically, his description and Professor Schmal's description of the 16th century are very, very similar. And the 16th century was very, very different from the Vienna of 1900. And that's what Freud was not fully aware also about sexuality and, and about repression and self-repression. And now we come to the sexual revolution in the West. This is, again, we go back to, this was my uh, intervention, but we will go back to the book. There is an effort in this real sexual revolution. So there, we had some early elements of the sexual revolution in the 20s, in the 30s, when Berlin in Weimar Germany was one of the places of newly discovered sexual freedoms, Vienna as well. Even Belgrade, many places. Uh, but what happens in uh, in Europe and the world in the 1950s, and especially after 68, there is an effort to deconstruct the ideal of beauty formulated by Johann, Joachim Winkelmann in the 18th century. And that ideal was embraced by the concept of hegemonic masculinity. Elements of what's male and what's female are dissolved and they are decomposed. Masculinity finally breaks free from the chains of the hegemonic model. The Vietnamese War 
helps. And the protest we had, uh, uh, I think, several days ago, uh, special event on, on how many years of Woodstock, uh, 60 or more, 60, I think, 60. Yes, we had 60 years. 60 years, yes, we had in Belgrade. At the university library, there is actually an ongoing exhibition, which you can see. And then the man, the male, gradually obtains right to be conscientious objector, to be a deserter, and to refuse to serve fatherland. Which would be nothing strange, you know, people would discuss it quite openly in the 16th century. Should you serve this city-state or not? Or should you do this or that? The army loses primacy in canonizing what masculinity is, but something there perhaps you should think about. Ultra-masculinity remains a feature of Mediterranean societies. That's mentioned in the book. Uh, and of course, in that sense, this region is closer to that model than, than to the other model. And finally, we come to the polymorphous body, uh, which is, uh, as Professor Schmala said, optimistically uh, framed uh, conclusion uh, we, it seemed like that in 2000. Uh, this includes um, new, new elements that appeared at the turn of two centuries. There is gradual promotion of male body, undressed and naked, which at the beginning of the 21st century took lead over the promotion of female body. There is no ideal body type of masculinity, rather there are numerous types that have in common the design and styling of the body. And this brings us to, to this question of uh, uh, de-essentialization de and its limits, because the full legal equality of sexes does not lead to the full equality of social roles. These are, of course, statistics from that period when the book was written in countries that allowed paternity leave as an option. In 95% of cases, the care of children remained female job. And Elizabeth Badinter advocated the model of an androgynous man, which is based on bisexuality and androgynous character of males. For Badinter, the man keeps male features although he's androgynous, expressive tactility, stronger impulse for playing, the use of strength and body, but these are only subtle differences in relation to female identity. Uh, or as Professor Schmala concludes, non-destructive polymorphous concepts of new body, images in arts, photography, film, make again the human body a key for understanding the world, and that, of course, includes something that is not in the book, something that I took from the National Geographic, gender revolution that happened, happen, that has been happening in Western societies primarily, and uh, that now, of course, uh, has reached the climax with 72 sexual identities, which are, of course, often which give very huge possibility for inclusion, but also very huge space for attacks by the far right. How could we implement this whole model to Serbia and the Balkans? First of all, what Professor Schmala insists is there were masculinities in Europe in the early modern period. So it's plural. They were both successive and competitive. It means you have one masculinity after another, but in the, at the same period of time, both in the age of Renaissance and today, there were competitive masculinities. So there is no reason to believe that it was different in the Balkans 
there is no reason to believe that the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire was very complex. It consisted of subsystems and systems. It's very complicated if the Ottoman Empire could even be defined as a state because it had no ways of controlling many areas. And Transteranoj famously spoke about democracy. They only, there was strong rule only along the roads. So what was happening around had very, very huge regional patterns. Uh, there were many books discussing uh, sexuality in folk heritage. This is one of them. Sexu sexu the sexual in our folk poetry, uh, composed by Alexander Kostic, the father of um, sexology in Yugoslavia and Serbia, already in the interwar period, the author of medical sexology and many other books. And uh, the problem is when you read these anthologies of folk, uh, contribution to sex sexuality, it's so contradictory that you cannot actually draw any conclusion. In one area, women are killed immediately if they have extramarital activity. In the other, extramarital activity is totally normal. Uh, to just to give an example, even in the famous Banovic Strachinje Tansin, and uh, it has different endings in different regions. Uh, how, how betrayal of Banovic Strachinje, the hero of the uh, of the of that uh, poem, is treated by punishment or by no punishment at all, which was even discussed by Goethe uh, and others during German Romanticism. Uh, or if we take uh, the dictionary of Fukarjic from the 1818, to which he added verba obscena, so all the words related to sexual activities of, the, of his compatriots from his village and all the areas he visited, they are so, it's such a big amount of words in the dictionary that we must conclude that sexuality was widely discussed. But then, in the second uh, edition of the dictionary, 30 years later, he erased all the words related to, sex, to everyday sexuality. That would be considered as verb of Senna, and this could be perhaps considered, it was obviously done because Habsburg Serbs were totally shocked by the first versions. Serbs in Serbia were not shocked at all, but Serbs in uh, the Habsburg Empire were very shocked. And uh, because he became a Serb in the Habsburg Empire, he lived in Vienna gradually and accepted. As we more read the book, we realize how he accepted layer by layer of their identity. He accepted also the beginnings of the hegemonic masculinity. In the second edition, he simply erased those words. And just to understand that it's still here when I was editor in chief at, at Zavod, uh, we had the biggest dictionary of uh, English, uh, Serbian English dictionary prepared by Professor Hlebets, who did glossary, not only the dictionary, but glossary. He was collecting words. And like Vukarajic, he collected all the words used there, including words used in sexual terminology. And uh, the editor didn't dare to let it. So she asked me, because I was editor-in-chief, uh, she said, if you sign at your own responsibility, those words could be added. I said, well, Vuk added those words in 1818, so no reason, so I sign, and it was added. But even in 2010, people were still thinking, should we have these words in the dictionary or not? So, simply, just to give an example. Uh, this heteronormativity that we discussed, that was canonized only after the French Revolution in Europe, uh, it was never canonized in the Ottoman Empire. Actually, the Ottoman Empire very early uh, decriminalized homosexuality. Uh, and uh, therefore, 
heteronormativity normativity never really existed in the way it existed in. It exists today in Islamic society, but it is the result of cultural transfer from Europe, and it's, it's already proven, especially to Indian, to Muslim India and Pakistan. So something that was imported from Europe is now, uh, it's a totally different. In the 19th century, French travelers were traveling to Arab countries because they wanted to see areas that were freer for sexual expression than Europe. Um, and then something else, Marina already touched it. There are traditional societies that are matrilinear and matrifocal, even better to use matrifocal. So it means that they are uh, focused on, on the mother and those that are patrifocal. So they are very different. And the fact that societies in Montenegro and Northern Albania were patrifocal, uh, which has been proven, does not mean that that same pattern with very low position of women existed everywhere in the Balkans and was exactly the same, which is what certain anthropologists who were dealing with the sexuality in the Balkans actually implied. And even when uh, it was the case, it doesn't mean that the case was the same at the beginning of one century, because all those societies were in interaction. So all of this we now need to integrate. And just to give you an example how complicated the whole thing is, I will refer to one film, and that's the film called Morris. Morris is the first pro-gay film allowed maybe not the first one that was filmed, but the first one that was allowed to be played openly in British societies, as late as 1987. It's with Hugh Grant. And uh, it happens in the early 20th century. Some parts were filmed at Oxbridge, and at a certain point they discuss Symposium of Plato, which is considered today as Bible of homoeroticism or homosexuality, whatever you want to, to take it. It's totally obvious what Plato speaks about there. But what's totally obvious is not what we are going to see. And here we come back to the Enlightenment. Uh, when I learned English, we had to learn a song during Yugoslav socialism, which was going for whites and black, uh, for white and black, yellow and brown from every village and every town. So the point was, we are inclusive. Yes, but we are inclusive in the sense of the Enlightenment. And that's, it. that's of course, the second part was not discussed. And we reduced everything to four categories, unlike Brazilian society, which has, I don't know how many categories for race, 30, 40, 50. So in Brazil, Barack Obama is not black, because he indeed is not black, if you look phenotypically. But in American society, he is black, and so he is in most of European societies. And it was the same with reading Plato. Symposium was not read in the same way in Paris and in London and at Oxford and Cambridge in 1900, because if homosexuality is considered as great sin, as it was in Victorian, post-Victorian England, you had to read Plato as a metaphor, while in Paris you read it as a, as a text and, and what, what it claims there. And of course you could see in art that it wasn't only the, the text, that basically it was reality of Greek life. And you could see that in, at the British Museum when those exhibits were allowed to be displayed. So, uh, what I want to say is that legal, cultural and other constraints in the past prevented us to see certain things. And in analyzing history of sexuality in the Balkans and Serbia, we need to read exactly the same books that have already been read hundreds of times but now using different conceptual models that will allow us to interpret them a little bit uh, differently than our predecessor did, who were uh, 
under the pressure of hegemonic masculinity, under the pressure of legal constraints, under the pressure of fear of their generational mates and how they would see. And of course, Alexander Kostic is one of the examples. He uh, was called Dr. Sex because of, you know, which was not really, today it would sound as quite a nice name. You, you could sell it in pop culture, but at that time it wasn't. It was real warning. What you're doing is dangerous for our society. Uh, so, uh, I think that um, this book may really help us because it's based on very serious research and because it provides all these nuances at the same time uh, giving us conceptual frameworks of, of how we could approach this topic. So thank you very much for the book and of course special thanks to Clio, to the publisher which supplied us with the translation almost in the same decade as it was published, and uh, that is an exception. Uh, and uh, But it's a good tradition that we had in the 1960s and 70s where when Yugoslav production was following the latest works in the history of sexuality. So thank you for renewing uh, this good uh, uh, tradition of, of the 1960s and 70s and bringing it back. And of course, thanks to Professor Schmale for the book. Thank you very much. Would you like something to add or discuss with Marina and Slobodan? Okay. Just uh, to, to say thank you for the close reading to both Marina and Slobodan, for the close reading of the book and what is more important that you have gone beyond what is in the book. So if you read it, read it in mind with the comments we, we had uh, here in during the pattern, May, only one one point which has been very important for me when uh, working on the primary sources and writing the books. Uh, in the book, you will find a kind of double helix, and uh, one part of the helix is uh, the development and transformation of societal types. So in a very general pattern, we, we start with a society of orders and uh, then the transformation goes in the direction of the consumer society, but which is also transformed by the court society that Norbert Elias has uh, described um, uh, the structure of the court society and the impact on the whole transformation of the entire society. And then with the French Revolution, late 18th century, it's what we call the bourgeois society, but for instance, the obligatory military service is part of the bourgeois society and not of the society of order and not of the court society and not of the early modern consumerist society, etc. So I, I link it uh, to that. And uh, of course, uh, the autobiographies were mentioned these are individual and subjective primary sources, but at least the writers reproduce general patterns they have learned only by living. And I think these patterns, you, you will find them in the society which and the ruling model in a certain period. So I think this is important for the understanding uh, of, of the book. So that's what I wanted to add. Now I will give. I would like as well to 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 thanks to to Mr. Hamovic, uh, the um, owner of the published book Leo, for the great translation as well, which is not unlikely now that we we have. Uh, unlike in 70s and 60s, the translators were very professional. Now we have sort of various qualities, but, but this one is is very good. As Marina uh, mentioned at the beginning, it just you can read it almost as a literature and it's it and in Serbian as well. Thank you very much. So I would like to to give a microphone to you to ask if you have to ask something, the audience. Hmm? Okay. 
it is hot and we have these ups and downs <laughs> with the electricity, but it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Would you? Oh, what was? No, no, thank you, thank you. So you don't. So I just wanna you you mentioned that I just wanna ask you just this. Uh, regarding methodology, with all due respect to the theory, but I'm, I was very amazed to these autobiographies that you, that you pick. It's, uh, let me simplify, it's not an oral history, but it, these are the ego documents, and it's part of the ego documents, and it gives, give, gave the book some kind of dynamic, and uh, we, we, it's more vivid than it would be without the autobiographies. And I just want to ask you, did you already had those, or what was the, your um, methodology of choosing them? Of course, in some way, in, in some, uh, for some um, uh, parts, you might, might didn't, didn't have uh, 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 much to choose between, but in, if for some chapters, you, you probably had more than one, and how, how did you decide? Did you, it, was it uh, previously researched by you, or you just it the get to you during the this re this research to you in mind to to include the autobiographies and I, I was very 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 um it was it's it's most interesting part is I think that I, for, for the sort is, is it as far as I'm concerned for this history of masculinity thank you yeah of course uh, there there are hundreds of autobiographies in each uh, century and it's difficult to make a choice because one autobiography cannot be representative uh, for, for all others. Um, I just read a lot Lots. of autobiographies and my impression was uh, for the 16th century Cellini. Um, he is really interesting uh, because it's at a crossroad of uh, various conception of masculinity. So he has a, a, a magic side and he explains how men have access to, to magic rituals and he uh, participated in such rituals and he describes it and he makes clear the background. And uh, this one can uh, tie back uh, to uh, philosophy in, Ren in Renaissance Italy, and you can see uh, which authors Cellini had read and used for interpreting what he has done. And this is the decisive, decisive point. Uh, I took autobiographies where you can follow a bit the lectures of the writers and how they try to understand their own life and masculinity with the books and other texts uh, they have uh, read. So, for instance, with Ulrich Breker, uh, who is from so lower bourgeoisie, uh, he apparently read Rousseau and other authors of uh, contemporary authors, and you have the impression that some uh, uh, parts of the text are very parallel to the confessions of Rousseau. And Rousseau too, he is very open in describing his sexual experiences as a young man, etc. And Breca too, uh, I won't say that he imitates Rousseau, but maybe this has been an encouragement to write about sexual intimacy in an autobiography. And he also includes patterns uh, from the understanding of the world, which are typical for the Enlightenment, for instance, the role uh, of the Lumiere of the Sun, and he positions him ha himself sometimes in the middle of the morning light uh, given by the Sun, and this, of course, this is um, enlightenment, um, and which he takes to interpret what have been his adventures or daily life, etc. So this helps him to, to understand himself. And so this is uh, the most important criteria for uh, the autobiographies I've chosen. Of course, there are others I use to confront with Janine Albrecht Dürer, also an artist. His diaries are completely different from Cellini, but uh, very um, interesting too. Uh, concerning uh, masculinity and his conception of masculinity. So he was married and his wife accompanied him to the Netherlands and all is on the level of gifts and honor. So what we normally know. And then we have autobiographies or biographies, letters, 
uh, thematizing friendship, for instance. And then in art, we, we have the representation of what friendship is. And there is a nice picture uh, which you can see in, in, in Vienna in the Kunsthistorische Museum, two men looking one to the other. And uh, the theory, uh, the contemporary theory, which is in this uh, picture, but you must know that there has been a theory, is that there is an exchange of a material exchange between these two persons who are friends. So it's not only uh, by your mind, but when you look to your friend and your friend to you, you exchange a very sublime matter. So that's... Uh, uh, all these are so many aspects uh, of masculinity um, which have been forgotten or loosened then in the 18th and 19th century. And, and that's the point, uh, to show that in earlier centuries, but in the same Europe, there were a lot, uh, ma many manners of being a man, uh, which should be rediscovered once again. Yeah? That, that is possible. A society can, can be livable, with uh, alternative masculinities, and this uh, belief was lost in the 19th and early 20th century. One thought very one-dimensional about society and the roles of men and women. So this is a, li a little bit a militant aspect of the book too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Here you are, but you just have. Yeah, just to say thanks again to all of the presenters. Uh, it was really interesting to, to hear all of you. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one relates to uh, Ivana's question, uh, and it's about the sources, and, but especially about the, the, like the second half of the 20th century, because, because it's obviously quite a different context to, I don't know, pre-modern period uh, in terms of these kind of um, evidences of how people were talking and the extent to which people were talking about sexuality. So how did you, uh, what kind of sources did you use in this period and I don't know the issue of selectivity of those sources, how did you uh, resolve that? So that's the first uh, question let's say and the second one was uh, just relating to your last comment uh, about kind of like uh, what was the drive behind all of these changes uh, uh, of masculinity throughout this period? Just if you could expand a bit more, you just talk uh, briefly. So, thank you. So the uh, the main sources for the early modern period are, are letters, advices from fathers to their sons. For instance, they they. There have been letters from, from a, a noble family and the father explained exactly to his son what he had to do when he's going to, to marriage and how to do to get child, etc. Yeah? This, this is an openness uh, which has been lost in the 18th, 19th century and with some taboos in the 20th century. Uh, Biographies or autobiographies, or what we call ego documents. So this is not fully elaborated, like uh, in the autobiography, etc. Uh, and letters. Letters are very important, uh, important source. Uh, but uh, what Marina uh, emphasized uh, was the body and the one sex model, etc. Of course, there is research by Lacour and others. Um, which I use. So this is not my own research, but uh, there has been a lot of research I, I, I could use. And um, now, with history go going on, I think there is a very slow transformation concerning the military sector, but also what Slobodan emphasized, this theoretical concept of gender relations by the Enlightenment. Uh, and indeed, I think the systemic approach and the new definition of the word system by the Enlightenment has been a decisive moment in the definition of uh, gender roles in society and the invention of a gender or sex identity. This did not exist before. We often believe it, that it's all the same from the late Middle Ages to the 19th century, it's all the same, it's a patriarchal society, etc. That's not right. Yeah? It's subtle. 
uh, transformations, but there are always transformations. I try to describe a bit this process in the book. Can I just add one thing? We have a uh, we had some I don't know, fifteen years ago, a diaries were published of Nikola Kerstich. He's a again Habsburg Serb who came to Serbia, became very prominent. And the sexual life of Belgrade that he describes is totally different to anything we have ever known. We don't believe it's the same town. I mean, I, I also am amateur historian of Belgrade. Uh, it's something totally different. And just it gives you an example why it is important to deal with this aspect of social history, in this case, intellectual history. It gives totally different picture. Belgrade becomes much more dynamic. Or a uh, book Katane Siba by Ivan Jankovic also, mm -hmm. even in the earlier period. And in this project, we also visited uh, cinema archives and um, Museum of Cinema Archives in Uzun Mirkova. And we know that that was the very rare place to which Serbs and Turks went together, but actually to watch Oriental dan dancers, female dancers, and maybe not only female, I don't know, but I suppose, I, I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, this was the, the case back then. So Belgrade was actually much more, just to give an example, it's, and certainly we know now about, we have studies about uh, narcotics used in the interwar Belgrade and other things. So we learn more and more from social history and we get more and more dynamic things. The problem is that every age curves our views of the past and uh, uh, we take simply ideational frameworks of our own age and it's very difficult to go back. So this is why these autobiographies and diaries in particular, because autobiographies, you know, people tend to take some things out, but diaries are really, really very valuable. and. Nikola Kerstich is really Arthur Schnitzler of Belgrade. And when Arthur Schnitzler's diaries were published, they also caused quite a huge surprise in Vienna on what he recorded. He recorded every sexual activity that he had, and he really had quite a lot of them. And the same applies to Nikola Kerstich. So uh, simply uh, uh, diaries and letters are really in addition to autobiographies, incredible source for all of this. And you see in, in some of the diaries that, that were quoted here, like Pips, they were intentionally written not to be published during their life. So th these are the type of sources we want to find. They reveal us, really. Autobiographies are usually written to justify whatever was your life, but diaries, letters, yes, this is very valuable. And finding them, it was like, you know, when Nikifor Ninkovic was found, and uh, again, the type of sexuality that he describes there uh, is very different from what we would expect. That's why we must speak about sexualities and masculinities. It's, it's enough to uh, read the diary of the barber of Prince Milos, and you realize that the concepts they had are very different than concepts of hegemonic masculinity. They are much more fluid. And because he also describes what Prince Milos replied to him when he said something, etc. And uh, so this is autobiography, this is not diary, but nonetheless, if we would be fortunate enough to find his diary, that would, who knows what we would find there. Thank you, Slobodan. Does anyone has any question? Still, as we are on with electricity, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, about exchange. Uh, I, I will ask you later to write me down the painting uh, uh, you mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> so, is it in the book? So, 
I will then look at it because <clears throat> that's also an important thing. It is this idea of uh, a mail exchange. We have it very much in in uh, uh, um, uh, um, history of science in anthropology. We have the uh, we have Levi Strauss uh, idea of uh, exchange of women as a basis of constitution of society as such. For for Levi Strauss, uh, this is how the the very society is is make is made through the the the, the male exchange. So let's actually go back to this idea of friendship, and I find it really important and maybe something worth exploring further. It, it sounds kind of really something is esoteric and odd, but it, it, it's not. I, I think it's kind of quite important, right? So stop. I should also add that we have several copies of the book, which we will first of all distribute to members of the team or associates of the team. But we would also like to give to the libraries of the institutes here and to keep one, of course, for the Library of the Faculty of Political Science, so that as many of you could, uh, could uh, use. So uh, uh, we will distribute four of them to our three distinguished uh, members of the Institute of European Studies and to the colleague from the Institute from Contemporary History who raised the question to, to thank him, to you, to you. So four books you will get and the remaining ones I think we should distribute to, I have one for the faculty, but maybe to other uh, institutes uh, that are member of the project. Anyone? Very good. Yeah, that's some also. Better searches in European studies. First of all, thank you so much. Kind lecture. I would like to ask you because the book is up to, to the year the 2000, but I would like to combine your research interests both about European Union and the history of masculinity, especially after the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. There, there is a huge debate of, about returning the military service in Europe. So. In your opinion, or for, for, for Professor Mark Lewis, in you, uh, what's your opinion? Is that some kind of the process of remasculinization in the old way, or it is something really new we are facing? It. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't think that this is what we could call remasculinization. Uh, it's not the 19th and early 20th century. So, um, all war parties in our period, and it's not only about Russian Federation and Ukraine, in other continents too, they, they use uh, military service from private enterprises, etc., etc. So, it's, it's not just the men fighting for their fatherland, as Slobodan uh, uh, quoted, uh, this is the 19th century idea of the French Revolution. I think this is over. And the second point is, of course, uh, a modern army is composed of men and women. And even if women are a minority, for instance, uh, in the Israel army or in the Ukrainian army, they are there. And the number is growing now. I, I think this is no more the field of masculinities. It can be. The, the private enterprises, uh, so far I know there are no women in it. So this might be a playing field for an old fashioned masculinity, but in general I would say no. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll try also to answer. Uh, it, you should actually take um, opinion polls conducted throughout Europe and um, you have a lot of uh, surveys, opinion poll surveys, I'm trying now to find some of them, in which uh, respondents were asked, would you defend your country when an enemy attacks your country? So very clearly, not when you know, you're know you sent, of course, hardly anyone would do that in, in Western Europe, except those who are professional soldiers, uh, or would you really die for your country? And, you know, the results are actually not very encouraging for nation states, I must say. And uh, uh, the situation has dramatically changed. So uh, it's not that uh, 
it's zero, it exists, and uh, in certain countries, it's um, it's even those who would fight who would fight for their country. Uh, their percentage is not small, but it's the smallest in the EU. Thirty-two uh, percent compared to 41% in the USA, and it's more or less a minority in every country. Of course, just before the Russian attack against Ukraine, the lowest percentage was in Germany. Actually, even some young people said, what would you do if Germany was attacked? We would actually flee to France. <laughs> was the reply. So, uh, it's very different. I think that the world has changed dramatically. Uh, even in Russia, there is a significant number of people, especially in urban areas, who are actually against the war. It, it's a hidden fact, but uh, you can see in Levada, this is the last independent uh, pollster, in, uh, which is, of course, an enemy organization, categorized as enemy organization now in Russia, but it still operates. And uh, you see that even this very stage, majority of uh, people in Russia are for an immediate peace. What it means, we can debate, it's not clear, but if you ask, would you accept immediate peace, they say yes. So that's, uh, the mood is, uh, th there is this legacy of post-1945 Europe, which cannot be erased so easily in spite of the fact that internally people are dissatisfied with uh, giving their jobs to immigrants or some or, or believing although you know most of those jobs nobody would do as you know in europe that immigrants do uh, but uh, okay they use health service uh, are entitled to certain rights that then reduce possibilities for others to use them or they are they believe they reduce although they contribute with their jobs again so when you calculate it it's debatable it's you at the end actually see that you profit from immigrants but that's not the way how uh, an average voter in certain even in certain new countries now now believes it's it's, it's different and uh, um i think that uh, all those countries that will now plan to return the obligatory military service will be very much surprised with the level of conscientious objectors and everything less else. And I think they will create a chaos. And I think that the government that do that will lose the next elections and will be held responsible. So I think they are playing uh, on a card of self-annihilation of themselves by bringing back the obligatory military service. Surprisingly, in Serbia, the percentage of those who support obligatory military service is higher among 18-25 group than in the group 65+. Plus. And, but there are reasons for that, because nobody understands what, uh, unfortunately, Brakjer was the among the first to understand, that serving obligatory military service and participating in a war as Belgrade is the primary example of it with 100,000 Rus young Russians, mostly male, coming here to avoid the war and not to be killed, actually. Uh, they don't understand that it's not a video game, but that actually participating in a war has serious consequences for the society, but also for those who participate. And uh, uh, when they are faced with that, the government's, you know, I think the government's debt plan to introduce it will, will face a very different reality very soon. And the reason why, by the way, uh, it was abandoned, the, the obligatory military service, is exactly because conscientious objectors and others were becoming bigger and bigger percentage, and even those who served obligatory military service had increasing number of requests. We need this, you cannot uh, deprive us of this human right, that human right, this or that. 
and not to mention in those countries where obligatory military service is for male only, that now we have male sex and male gender and female sex and female gender and 72 sexual identities. So all these governments, okay, they can say it's obligatory for everyone. That would be the way to, to, to avoid it. But that would be putting uh, additional pressure on certain vulnerable groups. So, and they will protest. So I'm not sure. I think it will um, it will cause huge consequences, negative, and will not bring anything. And actually, will not bring those those militaries will not be more effective. They will be less effective. And the moment they discover it, they will simply abandon. That's my opinion. They will simply abandon the idea. Hopefully, we won't come to this point of the, the reintroducing obligatory military. We are not far away, yeah, but okay, we, at least we are not there yet. Yes. So, we should wrap it up a bit, ending our like, electricity is again going off and on and it's, yeah, we are here for two hours, we, we promised, so if anyone has any thing to say Ed. okay i would just like to to suggest you to just to finish a little bit more a less depressing <laughs> mood so if if you ideally choose to 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 rewrite or write the 20th century 21st century chapter here just don't finish it at least don't with exclusively with toxic masculinity just maybe finish it with hybrid masculinity and more inclusive to give birth to oppressed ones, maybe. Yeah, to be less depressing. And you, Slobodan, you should write about history of masculinity in Serbia, at least 19th, 20th century. Yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah, just to join this Professor Spalin's book. Okay, so thank you very much. All three of you, it was very, very inspiring of this hot day. And thank you all for coming. Bye.